Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, does anybody love Jesus today? Anybody love Jesus? Man, when they told me I had 10 minutes, this Latino started sweating, amen? It takes us 10 minutes to introduce our first, middle, and last name. So this is gonna be, are there any Latinos in the house today? Any Latinos in the house today? Azuka, all right, all right, I'm Cuban, watch out. I'm about to preach this in two minutes, here we go. If you can turn your iPhones to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 38 through 39, I'm gonna be reading out of the ESV. It says this, y'all know the, the context, so I don't have to get too deep into it, but it says this. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and he clothed them with a coat of mail. And David was strapped, he was an OG, he was strapped with a sword over his armor and he tried in vain, somebody say in vain, to go for he had not tested them. <clears throat> then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Let's pray, Father bless this in Jesus' name, amen. That's the time we're running with. Really quick, I wanna tell a story and I wanna take us back to high school. Some of you just saw images in black and white, but that is okay. I wanna take us back to high school freshman year. I was getting bused to school. That means I went to school in the hood and I had to get bused somewhere else. Amen, anybody grow up in the hood? Bless God, there's four of us. If you're sitting next to that person, be careful. Watch your watch. <laughs> They think I'm lying. No, anyways, I remember uh, freshman year, I get out the bus and I'm girl crazy. I didn't know Jesus at this point. Some of y'all know Jesus, you're single and you're still girl crazy. But anyways, I didn't know Jesus and I remember the bus door open and I remember when the bus door opened, I saw this girl and it was like the one. It was like the heavens opened up, the spirit of God came down. I saw the angels playing the harp and I said, God, this is the one that I wanna be pleased with in Jesus' name. And I, I knew that that was the one and so I went on a reconnaissance mission. We didn't have Facebook back then so we actually had to stalk people. And so I had to, I had to figure out who she was, and I figured out her name was Rosa, or you could say Rosa, you can't say Rosa, you gotta say Rosa, right? And so I found out her name was Rosa, and she was a junior, man, and she was an older girl, and I was like, man, I'm gonna go for it, I'm gonna try, and so I tried everything to get this girl's attention, man, I was trying everything, and Rosa paid me no attention, she paid me no mind, and I had a class with one of her friends, so I asked her friend, I said, how come Rosa doesn't like me? She's like, well, you're not her type, and I was like, your mom, no, I'm just kidding, I wanted to say that, I felt it inside, and she said, she's not, you're, you're not her type. I said, well, what's her type? And I grew up going to high school in the 90s, and there was this thing on the West Coast called Rebels. And what basically you would have to do is you would dress a certain way, you had a certain haircut. So we would wear really baggy jeans that would cover your shoes. You would have these black boots. They were Harley boots. You would wear a tight shirt. You would have a chain wallet. You would shave all of your head, and you would leave your bangs, and you would paste it to the down, right? And so I went home to my dad that next day, and I said, Dad, I need some clothes. So he did what a good Latino father would do. He took me to the swap meet. And so we went to the swap meet and I got these big old baggy pants and, and I got these boots. They weren't Harley, they were Payless, but I kept them clean and I had the chain and I got this tight shirt and I was on Husky so my stomach was screaming, set me free. And so I had this thing on and, and so I shaved, my, I shaved my head, I kept my bangs, but I had curly hair so it looked like I had like a cockroach on my forehead. And, and so I went to school the next day and guess who noticed me? Rosa, man, yeah, I asked her for her pager number. She said, yes, we started dating, it was real serious. We went to Magic Mountain. And so we were at Magic Mountain, man, and that's like when you've reached like your marriage next or quinceanera, one or the other. And so uh, we're at Magic Mountain and all of a sudden Rosa breaks up with me. She dumps me and she leaves me in front of Batman out of all the rides, you could have left me somewhere, she left me in front of Batman. And so she broke up with me, man, and I found myself, she left, and I found myself sitting there with these Payless boots that I wish were Harleys, these big old baggy pants, a chain wallet with no money in it, a tight shirt, my belly was still screaming, set me free. I had a cockroach on my head and I was sitting there broken hearted. And you know what I realized in that moment? In that moment, I realized that I was trying to be something that I was never intended to be in order to have something I was never intended to have. And I share that story with us because so much in the planting process, we get started with this understanding and this idea of who God is and who he's called us to be. And we have these blueprints and we're excited and we're confident and we know what God has called us to do. And then all of a sudden we step out and we don't see the results in the timetable that we desire to see in men, not realizing that everything has been made beautiful in God's timing and not yours. 
And so we don't start seeing the results we, we want to see. And we're comparing our chapter 1 to someone else's chapter 20. And then all of a sudden we feel like we have to be somebody else and something else. And we start taking on all of these things. If I could just preach like that, Pastor. If I could just have LED screens like that, church. If I could just have a full-time staff like that. If my pants can just be as tight as that. If I could have this, then I would have that. And we find ourselves like David. David knew who he was. David was a G. David was a gangster, not a little G, big G. David knew how to fight off lions and tigers and bears. Who me, who mine. He knew how to fight this giant that stood before him. He knew how to fight this Goliath. And he comes and he stands up in a place where nobody else is willing to stand up and go do something. He stands up in a city where nobody else is willing to go plant a church. Amen. And he gets up and he says, I'll do it. And then all of a sudden, he gets in front of the most influential people. He's got the king, the king's horses, Humpty Dumpty. Everybody is in the room. And he knows what he needs to do. He knows where his confidence comes from. He knows the blueprint. He knows how to fight. He knows how to take it down. But then he's in a room of influential people. And he feels that he has to conform to the pattern of the... In order to receive something that was already going to be his in his own skin. And so in the midst of the pressure, everybody looks around him and said, no, nah, he can't do it. There's no way he can do it. He's definitely not going to do it. There's some people in your corner that they have said, you will never amount to nothing. You will never pastor again. You will never do it. And some of you have succumbed to the lie. Maybe God brought me here to tell you, you need to stop believing the lie. And you need to start believing the voice of the one who is and the one who is to come and the the one who has called you with a purpose and the one who has called you with a mission. And so he's in this place and he feels this pressure. And so he takes on the armor and the Bible says he took it on. Now he took on armor that would never fit him. The armor was coutured. I come from the fashion industry. Coutured means it was one of a kind to only fit Saul. So this would have never fit him. And so he puts the armor on, the Bible says. And, and I wonder what he thinks in that moment. But the Bible says he took a step and he took a step in vain. Vain means he took a wasted step. There was no significance. There was no importance. There was no helpful implications that can come out of that. He took a step in the right direction into his destiny, wearing something that he was never intended to wear. But if he would have just had the confidence to say, I don't need that because I'm already headed in the direction that God has called me to. And I'm going to tear down this giant in the time that God has called me to. So he takes the step. And in vain, but then he comes to his senses, and I, I can only imagine what was going on. The Bible isn't clear, scripture isn't clear, but I wonder if he began to wrestle in that moment. Uh, this isn't me. God, this isn't who you called me to be. This isn't how you called me to do it. And I wonder if he had that moment. Maybe some of you are there where you've started on this journey, but you've been so insecure. You've been so intimidated by every church around you and everybody that's succeeding at a rate that's not in your pace and in your lane. And you found yourself carrying the weight of trying to sustain something that you weren't intended to sustain. Every time you carry things that you weren't intended to carry, when you take a step, even if it's in the right direction, you're taking a step in vain. And maybe God brought me here to say that he's ready to shake some things off of you, that enough is enough, that that you are more than enough, that you are a conqueror in Christ Jesus, that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So maybe you need to shake some things off, baby, so that you can step into everything that God has called you to step into. I wish we would stop taking steps in vain. I wish that we would be more confident and secure like the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1.1. It says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. That one verse has incredible implications, four incredible implications, and this is what it is. In that one sentence, Paul said this, this is who I am, I am Paul. This is what I do, I am an apostle. This is who I do it for, God's holy people. And this is my authority, Jesus. Paul could stand with this confidence in authority. My question to you is, who are you? What did God call you to do? Who are you doing it for and where is your authority? Let me tell you something, influence doesn't come from your Instagram followers, from the size of your congregation. 
congregation, from your LED screen, how cool your outfit is. That's just smoke and mirrors. Influence comes from when you know who you are. You know who your God is. You know who he calls you to. And you know the authority and the anointing. Come on, if you believe that, I want you to give God your best shout of praise this morning. See it, man. God has called you. Walk in your purpose. Amen. Amen.